cup of tea unicorn here and I just want to say that my femininity content is here to stay. I understand that there are sectors that have come and gone surrounding femininity, level up. Um, I can't say that I belong to these sectors or that I belong to any sector. My community is very small and very isolated. But um, as far as like, for example, the level up as a concept, I subscribe to that. I believe in that. Regardless of, you know, who goes to jail or who was scamming or who, like, I still believe in that. It's like how Christians may have a pastor who is worthless, but they don't necessarily leave the religion because the teacher was worthless. They still subscribe to the worldview, so one thing I want to say about femininity and femininity journeys is that it's nice to embark upon a femininity journey because of men or because you're this heterosexual woman who seeks gender normative roles and heteronormative roles. But at the end of the day and night, your femininity journey is for you and it has to, like you've got to be the main character. For this journey, you need main character energy because that's what femininity does for you. It Marilyn Monroe's you. It's something. There was a guy who was walking down the street with Marilyn Monroe and she was talking about how she loved to be in New York instead of L.A., right? Because in L.A., everybody knew who she was, but New York was so crowded that she could just blend in and do normal person things. And then she said to him, do you want to see her? And he's like, what? Do you want to see me become her? And then, uh, right, because she's Norma Jean. And the guy goes, sure. And there's something she turned on inside of herself that literally people were like, oh, my God, it's Marilyn Monroe after she did that. And he was like, I don't know how she did it. She had, she would, she was wearing the same trench coat and the same hat and the same hairstyle, the same shoes, and nobody noticed her. And she said, do you want to see me become her? And now everybody is thronging us for autographs and whatnot. She turned on a Marilyn Monroe level of feminine main character energy. Do y'all understand? Like she turned on something in her mind that radiated in her aura. She was walking down that street as Norma Jean with that man and then turned on Marilyn Monroe. What I love about Marilyn Monroe is that it's a character. We can all be Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe doesn't have a color, just like Betty Boop. Right, uh, you see her reimagined as a white woman, but really Marilyn Monroe took her character, and I wouldn't I wouldn't say that this qualified as culture vultureism, even though it can look that way, because Marilyn really loved uh, black women. I think she did have a lot of ignorance, and was one of those white people who, like, when she did have a, a black woman working for her, she. She was too much and her her black um, aide ran away. But nevertheless, like she truly idealized um, the woman behind Betty Boop. And that's a black woman. And Betty Boop is an energy. Marilyn Monroe is an energy. It's not a person that ever existed. Like what Marilyn was like her mom's name or something. And Monroe was like the last name. I, I don't know. But it wasn't her name. That wasn't the real name. She was, she was born Norma Jane, right? And she had an incredibly hard life as a child. And I think her story, if you look into the biography of Marilyn Monroe, is so similar to that of an African-American woman Sans the racism, obviously, but you're still a woman and you still deal with sexism and being the physically weaker gender and underestimated and over just sexual, whatever, right? She turned her pain into power. 
And Marilyn Monroe wasn't slapping people around. She wasn't jumping people and stumping people out. Like, so what was her power, right? She didn't join STEM research. She wasn't some engineer, but she turned that pain into power. Star power, do as I say power, Hollywood royalty power. If the president could be with anybody, if John F. Kennedy could be with anybody, heck, and his brother, if if he could leave Jackie O and marry me, he would. Like, everybody wants me. Energy. I think that that's a very powerful thing, and it's a gift that I would love to grant specific African-American women. Some African-American women already have it. But at the end of the day, that's icing on the cake. But I would say that like the flower of the cake is you. The eggs of the cake is that journey, like the butter, like we can go on ingredient per ingredient. But the point is like this journey should not center men. It should not center your desire to be desired. It should center your healing as an African-American woman who has been masculinized by your society from the time that you got here having castrated, but broken men, and you had to stand in the gap for the entire black family. And unfortunately, you never stopped. And now you are being punished for the strength you were begged to have. I want you to transmute that energy like an alchemist and turn that pain into power. And that power is in reclaiming your femininity. So no, I'm not going to stop. Somebody was like, oh, the femininity top sector toppled because of these kind of content creators. I'm still here and I'm not a sector, I'm a person. With Marilyn Marilyn Monroe energy to offer. With Jessica Rabbit energy to offer. And it's not going anywhere. With maternal energy to offer. And it's not going anywhere. With Moon. Lord have mercy. With Rohini energy to offer. With Venus native energy to offer, offer, with moon dominated energy to offer. Now, I said all of that according to Vedic astrology, but all of that, you know, is very feminine, basically. And some African American women, we really want to break out of that masculine thing because it no longer serves us, serves us, and we're trying to be like. I say that we're trying to be like the finches, right? Evolution says this. You either evolve what you need to survive or you die. That's evolution, okay? You evolve features that you need or you die. And when you go and you have your first biology class, you know, uh, in high school or even at a university, they, they teach you about the finches. They teach you about all the finches and how they evolved. They were literally put in different environments. They were all the same bird. They looked alike, squawked alike, walked alike. Just, just, it's all the same bird. Tweet, 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 right? But they were put in different areas and they were forced to evolve or die. So when I say evolution on these finches, you see the cactus finch developed a beak that could get water from a cactus. The warbler finch the tree fin like all these different finches i think there were like maybe nine in total or something they just changed they just started to look different one ended up with a smaller body than the other the other ones ended up with a lengthier wingspan like they just had to change and what african-american women are trying to do is evolve because that's not the world that we live in anymore and we have to evolve And what we need the most is femininity. So I'm never going to stop pushing this content. So long as I'm a content creator, like I'm never going to neglect 
femininity just because it quote unquote isn't all the rage anymore or it's not super cool anymore or it's some kind of defeated community. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care who's still making this content or who is not. At the end of the day, African-American women have a very special, very special relationship to our femininity because it was taken from us. Some of us never had a never had a chance to embrace it, never had a chance to get to know it. I mean, if you measure the rhino by the standards of a fish, it's useless. I mean, if you measure a giraffe by the standards of a dog, last place every time. We are women who have been measured by the standard of men. Like literally this whole co-equal men thing that white women think that they want so much with their feminism. We know how exhausting that is. Because we've been men. And maybe some of us were only tomboys in middle school or elementary school. But we had the moments where we were forced. Where our girlhood was taken from us. And we were adultified and we were forced to be rougher and tougher. How dare you wear pink in a dress? You're fast. You must want to have sex. And these are grown men and women talking to you when you're only 11. How dare you do your hair? What what do you need eyeliner for? Aren't you 12? You're a bad girl. Right? Some of these men out here supporting you and wearing these bonnets is because they want to keep you as an underclass beneath them. They don't want you walking around with all that beautiful feminine energy that it, that attracts men and servants. I make it a point because, look, I used to fly all the time, okay? Uh, straight up globetrotter, no cap. And I used to dress very comfortably too. I'd always wear some slip-ins and some leggings. Or um, when I was a practicing Muslim, I would wear something called an abaya. And it's just a very loose flowing fabric. And I'd wear something called a bati underneath it. And just be comfortable. But once I reclaimed my femininity I started dressing different everyone dresses down at the airport but when I go I make sure I look cute I look sure I make sure and I don't mean like like cute and like you know some matching sweatpants athleisure outfit I wear dresses I wear short dresses I wear boots makeup wigs like I look like a doll And I get the best service, the most courteous people. People help me with everything I need help with. Even though I travel so frequently, I really shouldn't need help with much. But people offer me so much care and concern because I look like a lady. Now, I could be the same person dressed a totally different way and get treated differently. Acting a different way and get treated totally differently. That's a power, I believe. And women like me having. But it has to start with you. Because some of us don't have the self-worth. To embrace our femininity. We don't believe that we deserve it. We believe that we are masculine. We believe that we can't compete with the feminine. Like maybe that girl who's feminine is prettier than us. Here's a deal. Maybe she is. Want to know something? You can still be better than her. There are plenty of women who are more beautiful than me that I will always, I can be 40 or 50, I will always have access to better men than them. Better, I mean, better men than what they can have and what they can achieve because of my personality and because of the type of heart that beats within my chest. Some of this femininity stuff is very similar to what witches and mystics and alchemists do when they're doing dark work because you kind of have to search your soul for what took it from you what took it away from you was it all the beatings when you were a child and you were born in the 70s and 80s where you know african americans still beat their children like slaves because they hadn't evolved yet and they broke your pride and you know they're doing the same thing you know the same buck breaking that was done to their ancestors to their own kids Was it all the molestation? Was it all the you're ugly, you're big, you're fat? Like, what was it that took it from you? Oh, you're too dark. 
because that's the thing you have to find and own the most. One of the things I was the most humiliated for was for being, you know, people called me big. Now, when I say big, I mean thick and tall. I don't mean a fat kid. Once I I used to be ashamed of being tall. I hated being tall. My best friends were always short and petite um, because I, I admired their their image so much I wished I had it because my childhood had been snuffed out of me right I was too tall to be a child what do you mean she's nine she's taller than the teacher what do you mean she's 11 she's bigger than all the adults here in the sixth grade people thought I was a mother of other sixth graders like white moms would come up to me and you know you're the youngest looking mother here I don't know what you do but you look amazing I, I I can't make this stuff up But when I kept getting called big and tall and made fun of for it, now what I wield the hardest and the strongest is the fact that I'm an Amazon woman. I remember Meg the Stallion said, you know, if I if I mess with him once, all he's gonna like is tall girls. Meg gets it. Meg, I don't know how many times she's been made fun of for being built how she's built but in reality people purchase our bodies and they purchase high heels to be taller I'm like I see you imitating me and that only empowers me I see you mocking me because I have what you don't and that only empowers me it's just like being the darkest sister in the room okay everybody made fun of you for being the darkest sister in the room but now with all these fake tans and all these fake wannabe black passing, black fishing, like that can be to your advantage because most of the people you enter a room, most of the people are the same darn color. They're in the same color palette, even if they're black and white people. Black, white, Asian, like Hispanic, like like they're in the same color palette. Pale and light brown shades of brown. You walk in and by merit of your color alone, you command attention. And if you believe that you deserve it and you do that dark work on yourself, you're going to keep it. And people will be kind to you and serve you. If you are dark skinned and you have low self esteem about being dark skinned, people are going to treat you like that dark skinned thing, stereotype that is lesser. But if you walk around like Bria Miles, like Naomi Campbell, like Iman, that that dark skin is only ever going to benefit you, is only ever going to aid you, will turn you into a unicorn, depending on how dark you really are. That thing that gave you the most pain, you find it and you turn it into a strength. You turn it into something that you wield with pride. Maybe you have type 4 elemental Q hair. Forget 4, A, B, and C. Maybe you got something, you're you're type 4, Z. And everybody told you, you look like Kunta Kinte and whatever else. I dare you to grow that out. I dare you to take care of that. I dare you to wear it out short. As a teeny weeny afro, I dare you not to pull on your shrinkage. I dare you to teach yourself every day with recorded affirmations that that is not hair, that it's a crown. That can never be removed. That when you sleep, when you eat, when you work, when you go to the bathroom and defecate, you're a queen because that crown is fastened to your head. It's the thing where it tends to be the roughest thing where people stole your beauty and stole your femininity. That once you get a hold of that, you can get a hold. Oh, excuse me, I'm stretching. I think all black people stretch like that. 
where it comes out of our throat and we make noises anyhow. It tends to be that thing where people mask that thing that people use to masculinize you with. You make it you love it. You teach yourself to love it and to embrace it. And that's power. And that's power. People really treat you how you think of yourself. So you have to then unthink these things. I'm saying all of this because this is basically an introduction into dark work. So many people say, dark work, do the dark work, dark work. And it's like, well, what is that? (laughs) It's where you fix what hurt you, okay? It's where you go to the broken bone that healed the wrong way and you re-break that mug to realign it properly. But you do it to your soul. You do it to your mind. You do it to your heart. Everything radiates from there. I'm going to tell you something about me that I never quite understood, but I do now. I am literally never the prettiest woman in the room. But I am literally always the most desirable woman in the room. I'm never the prettiest. I never have the best face. I do often, I used to have the best body in the room, but you know, 200 something pounds later, no. Always the most desirable woman in the room. Couldn't figure out why. I thought it was very strange. You don't have to be the prettiest woman in the room. So when these people are ranking you and telling you what you can get and what you can't get, go look at some of these high value men's wives. None of them are the none of them are Sierra. Maybe for Russell Wilson, he's with a 10. He's with Sierra. For whoever's going to marry Chloe Bailey, maybe he's with Chloe Bailey. But by and large, some of these powerful men that you want to be with, they're never with the most beautiful woman in the room. In fact, sometimes the most beautiful woman in the room is a liability because she attracts too much attention. And it's a type of attention that she attracts that is problematic. How do I have that kind of power where everybody screams wife at me? Not girlfriend, not side chick, not tip drill, but everybody screams wife at me. How? I trained myself for so long when I was a practicing Muslim and also when I was a Christian. Learning how to be a wife, anything that a Muslim woman was supposed to be, I bought a book on it. This is in the early 2000s. This is pre-YouTube. Yeah, I'm that old. It's like, oh, you know, there's this book called The Ideal Muslima, and there's one by uh, the International Publishing House, and there's one by, oh, gosh, what was that called? I don't know. I, I forgot what the other book company was, but it's based in Saudi Arabia. And then the other one was based in India. And I was like, well, I'm getting both. Two different books called the same thing. I'm getting both. How to be the ideal Muslim mother. How to be the ideal Muslim woman. How to be the ideal believer. How to be the ideal... I, I, I ate it all day. That was my diet. You are what you eat. So when I walked into the world, even with my face covered, right, because I covered my face for like seven or eight years, there's hijab and then there's naqab, right? The hijab is where the Muslim woman has everything covered but her face and her hands, and the naqab is when nothing is visible but your eyes. How are men not seeing me? Not seeing anything but my eyes and sometimes my hands if I don't have on gloves. And they're like, that, her, I want that one, I want to marry her. Bible has the answer. As a man thinketh, 
So is he somebody destroyed how you think about yourself and how you think about your femininity and what your right is to that thing? And I'm saying the journey doesn't end with a trend. The journey doesn't end with whose channel is is a bop and whose channel is a flop. It, It doesn't end there. You have to stay the course even when it's not cool. I remember the first time I grew my hair to my waist. One of the things they said was, in order to grow your hair to your, you know, to classic length or tailbone length, you can't follow the trends. When ombre became a thing, I fell in love. To this day, I'm in love with ombre hair. It's still a look to me. But they were just like, you can't do the trends. You can't do what everybody's doing. Even when that song, It's the Bob for Me, came out and everybody wanted to wear bobs because you see her out there bobbing freely, (laughs) stiff wear. It's like, no, you can't be on trend. Everybody's got that ombre, but your hair is not dyed because you have a goal. Everybody's got that bob, but your hair is not cut because you have a goal. You go somewhere, people's hair is done and yours isn't a bun on a long braid down your back because you're trying to preserve something. You're trying to grow something, trying to protect something. You're going to be off trend. But you have to be willing to do the uncool thing to self-actualize. So if you do want to self-actualize as a feminine woman, I don't care how big you are, I don't care how much you weigh, I don't care what your skin color is, you can There's this woman on TikTok that, I mean, she's like a four in the face. I'll be honest. She's a, oh, she's a four in the face. But her personality, her smile, megawatt smile, megawatt. Beautiful body, beautiful skin color, hair always done, makeup to the nines. Some of her features, her eyes, her forehead, the way her eyebrows sit, it's not all of that. But she could take your man if she wanted to. I'm sure she wouldn't want to. I was listening, I was looking through some of her TikToks and I'm like, hey, here's a woman who's almost been proposed to as many times as I have. Like men just get with her and propose. It's her energy. She's the first to talk to you about vasopressin. She's the first to talk to you about the science of men. And you can tell she knows what she's talking about because she's happy. And she's ultra feminine. Now, again, men icing on the cake. But the femininity journey is, in effect, I mean, it's a, it's a self-love journey. Because some of us, we play hard, but we know we're feminine. We know we're girly. We know we'd rather be. So anyhow, femininity content, here to stay. Anytime I have anything beneficial to say, I'm going to say it. I mean, the most complete form of love is when you love for your brother what you love for yourself. I love the life that I have. I love the man that I'm with. I love the way that I live because of the dark work that I've done, which has resulted in the things that I've attracted. And if you want that journey as well, all aboard.